Oliver Twist, Chapter Forty One. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Brad Philippone. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens, Chapter Forty One, containing fresh discoveries and showing that surprises, like misfortunes, seldom come alone. Her situation was indeed one of no common trial and difficulty. While she felt the most eager and burning desire to penetrate the mystery in which Oliver's history was enveloped, she could not but hold sacred the confidence which the miserable woman with whom she had just conversed had reposed in her as a young and guileless girl. Her words and manner had touched Rose Maylie's heart, and mingled with her love for her young charge, and scarcely less intense in its truth and fervour, was her fond wish to win the outcast back to repentance and hope. They purposed remaining in London only three days prior to departing for some weeks to a distant part of the coast. It was now midnight of the first day. What course of action could she determine upon which could be adopted in eight-and-forty hours? Or how could she postpone the journey without exciting suspicion? Mr. Losburn was with them, and would be for the next two days, but Rose was too well acquainted with the excellent gentleman's impetuosity, and foresaw too clearly the wrath with which, in the first explosion of his indignation, he would regard the instrument of Oliver's recapture to trust him with a secret, when her representations in the girl's behalf could be seconded by no experienced person. These were all reasons for the greatest caution and most circumspect behaviour in communicating it to Mrs. Maylie, whose first impulse would infallibly be to hold a conference with the worthy doctor on the subject. As to resorting to any legal adviser, even if she had known how to do so, it was scarcely to be thought of for the same reason. Once the thought occurred to her of seeking assistance from Harry, but this awakened the recollection of their last parting and it seemed unworthy of her to call him back when the tears rose to her eyes as she pursued the trade of reflection he might have by this time learnt to forget her and to be happier away disturbed by these different reflections inclining now to one course and then to another and again recoiling from all as each successive consideration presented itself to her mind Rose passed a sleepless and anxious night. After more communing with herself next day, she arrived at the desperate conclusion of consulting Harry. "'If it be painful to him,' she thought, "'to come back here, how painful it will be to me! But perhaps he will not come. He may write, or he may come himself, and studiously abstain from meeting me. He did when he went away. I hardly thought he would.' but it was the better for us both. And here Rose dropped the pen, and turned away as though the very paper which was to be her messenger should not see her weep. She had taken up the same pen, and laid it down again fifty times, and had considered and reconsidered the first line of her letter without writing the first word, when Oliver, who had been walking in the streets with Mr. Giles for a bodyguard, entered the room in such breathless haste and violent agitation as seemed to betoken some new cause of alarm. "'What makes you look so flurried?' asked Rose, advancing to meet him. "'I hardly know how. I feel as if I should be choked,' replied the boy. "'Oh, dear, to think that I should see him at last, and you should be able to know that I have told you the truth!' "'I never thought you had told us anything but the truth,' said Rose, soothing him. "'But what is this? Of whom do you speak?' "'I have seen the gentleman,' replied Oliver, scarcely able to articulate. "'The gentleman who was so good to me, Mr. Brownlow, that we have so often talked about.' "'Where?' asked Rose. "'Getting out of a coach,' replied Oliver, shedding tears of delight, "'and going into a house. I didn't speak to him, I couldn't speak to him, for he didn't see me, and I trembled so that I was not able to go up to him. But Giles asked for me whether he lived there, and they said he did. "'Look here,' said Oliver, opening a scrap of paper. "'Here it is. Here's where he lives. I'm going there directly. Oh, dear me, dear me, what shall I do when I come to see him and hear him speak again?' With her attention not a little distracted by these and a great many other incoherent expressions of joy, Rose read the address, which was Craven Street, in the Strand. 
she very soon determined upon turning the discovery to account quick she said tell them to fetch a hackney coach and be ready to go with me i will take you there directly without a minute's loss of time i will only tell my aunt that we are going out for an hour and be ready as soon as you are oliver needed no prompting to dispatch and in little more than five minutes they were on their way to craven street when they arrived there rose left oliver in the couch under pretence of preparing the old gentleman to receive him and sending up her card by the servant requested to see mr brownlow on very pressing business the servant soon returned to beg that she would walk upstairs and following him into an upper room miss maylie was presented to an elderly gentleman of benevolent appearance in bottle green coat at no great distance from whom was seated another old gentleman in nankeen breeches and gaiters who did not look particularly benevolent and who was sitting with his hands clasped on the top of a thick stick and his chin propped thereupon dear me said the gentleman in the bottle green coat hastily rising with great politeness i beg your pardon young lady i imagine it was some importunate person who i beg you will excuse me be seated pray "'Mr. Brownlow, I believe, sir,' said Rose, glancing from the other gentleman to the one who had spoken. "'That is my name,' said the old gentleman. "'This is my friend, Mr. Grimwig. Grimwig, will you leave us for a few minutes?' "'I believe,' interposed Miss Maylie, "'that at this period of our interview I need not give that gentleman the trouble of going away. If I am correctly informed, he is cognizant of the business on which I wish to speak to you.' Mr. Brownlow inclined his head. Mr. Grimwig, who had made one very stiff bow and risen from his chair, made another very stiff bow and dropped into it again. "'I shall surprise you very much, I have no doubt,' said Rose, naturally embarrassed. "'But you once showed great benevolence and goodness to a very dear young friend of mine, and I am sure you will take an interest in hearing of him again.' "'Indeed,' said Mr. Brownlow. "'Oliver Twist you knew him as,' replied Rose. The words no sooner escaped her lips than Mr. Grimwig, who had been affecting to dip into a large book that lay on the table, upset it with a great crash, and, falling back in his chair, discharged from his features every expression but one of unmitigated wonder, and indulged in a prolonged and vacant stare. Then, as if ashamed of having betrayed so much emotion, he jerked himself, as it were, by a convulsion into his former attitude and looking out straight before him emitted a long deep whistle which seemed at last not to be discharged on empty air but to die away in the innermost recesses of his stomach mr brownlow was no less surprised although his astonishment was not expressed in the same eccentric manner he drew his chair nearer to miss maylie's and said do me the favour my dear young lady to leave entirely out of the question that goodness and benevolence of which you speak, and of which nobody else knows anything, and if you have it in your power to produce any evidence which will alter the unfavourable opinion I was once induced to entertain of that poor child, in heaven's name put me in possession of it. A bad one? I'll eat my head if he is not a bad one, growled Mr. Grimwig, speaking by some ventriloquial power, without moving a muscle of his face. "'He is a child of a noble nature and a warm heart,' said Rose, colouring, "'and that power which has thought fit to try him beyond his years "'has planted in his breast affections and feelings "'which would do honour to many who have numbered his days six times over.' "'I'm only sixty-one,' said Mr. Grimwig, with the same rigid face. "'And as the devil's in it if this Oliver is not twelve years old at least, "'I don't see the application of that remark.' "'Do not heed my friend, Miss Maylie,' said Mr. Brownlow. "'He does not mean what he says.' "'Yes, he does,' growled Mr. Grimwig. "'No, he does not,' said Mr. Brownlow, obviously rising in wrath as he spoke. "'He'll eat his head if he doesn't,' growled Mr. Grimwig. "'He would deserve to have it knocked off if he does,' said Mr. Brownlow. "'And he'd uncommonly like to see any man offer to do it,' responded Mr. Grimwig, knocking his stick upon the floor. "'Having gone thus far,' The two old gentlemen severally took snuff, and afterwards shook hands, according to their invariable custom. "'Now, Miss Maylie,' said Mr. Brownlow, "'to return to the subject in which your humanity is so much interested, 
"'Will you let me know what intelligence you have of this poor child, "'allowing me to promise that I exhausted every means in my power of discovering him, "'and that since I have been absent from this country, "'my first impression that he has imposed upon me, "'and had been persuaded by his former associates to rob me, "'has been considerably shaken?' "'Rose, who had had time to collect her thoughts, "'at once related in a few natural words all that had befallen Oliver since he left Mr. Brownlow's house, reserving Nancy's information for that gentleman's private ear, and concluding with the assurance that his only sorrow for some months past had been not being able to meet with his former benefactor and friend. "'Thank God,' said the old gentleman. "'This is great happiness to me, great happiness. But you have not told me where he is now, Miss Maylie. You must pardon my finding fault with you. But—' "'Why not have brought him?' "'He is waiting in a coach at the door,' replied Rose. "'At this door!' cried the old gentleman, with which he hurried out of the room, down the stairs, up the coach-steps, and into the coach, without another word. When the room-door closed behind him, Mr. Grimwig lifted up his head, and, converting one of the hind legs of his chair into a pivot, described three distinct circles with the assistance of his stick and the table, sitting in it all the time. After performing this evolution, he rose and limped as fast as he could up and down the room at least a dozen times, and then, stopping suddenly before Rose, kissed her without the slightest preface. "'Hush!' he said, as the young lady rose in some alarm at this unusual proceeding. "'Don't be afraid. I'm old enough to be your grandfather. You're a sweet girl. I like you. Here they are.' In fact, as he threw himself in one dexterous dive into his former seat, Mr. Brownlow returned, accompanied by Oliver, whom Mr. Grimwig received very graciously, and if the gratification of that moment had been the only reward for all her anxiety and care in Oliver's behalf, Rose Maylie would have been well repaid. "'There is somebody else who should not be forgotten, by the by,' said Mr. Brownlow, ringing the bell. "'Send Mrs. Bedwin here, if you please.' The old housekeeper answered the summons with all dispatch and, dropping a curtsey at the door, waited for orders. "'Why, you get blinder every day, Bedwin,' said Mr. Brownlow, rather testily. "'Well, that I do, sir,' replied the old lady. "'People's eyes, at my time of life, don't improve with age, sir.' "'I could have told you that,' rejoined Mr. Brownlow. "'But put on your glasses, and see if you can't find out what you were wanted for, will you?' The old lady began to rummage in her pocket for her spectacles, but Oliver's patience was not proof against this new trial, and, yielding to his first impulse, he sprang into her arms. "'God be good to me!' cried the old lady, embracing him. "'It is my innocent boy! My dear old nurse!' cried Oliver. "'He would come back! I knew he would!' said the old lady, holding him in her arms. "'How well he looks, and how like a gentleman's son he is dressed again! Where have you been this long, long while? Ah, the same sweet face, but not so pale, the same soft eye, but not so sad. I have never forgotten them or his quiet smile, but have seen them every day side by side with those of my own dear children, dead and gone since I was a lightsome young creature. Running on thus, and now holding Oliver from her to mark how he had grown, now clasping him to her and passing her fingers fondly through his hair, the good soul laughed and wept upon his neck by turns. Leaving her and Oliver to compare notes at leisure, Mr. Brownlow led the way into another room, and there heard from Rose a full narration of her interview with Nancy, which occasioned him no little surprise and perplexity. Rose also explained her reasons for not confiding in her friend Mr. Losburn in the first instance. The old gentleman considered that she had acted prudently, and readily undertook to hold solemn conference with the worthy doctor himself. To afford him an early opportunity for the execution of this design, it was arranged that he should call at the hotel at eight o'clock that evening, and that in the meantime Mrs. Maylie should be cautiously informed of all that had occurred. These preliminaries adjusted, Rose and Oliver returned home. Rose had by no means overrated the measure of the good doctor's wrath. 
Nancy's history was no sooner unfolded to him than he poured forth a shower of mangled threats and execrations, threatening to make her the first victim of the combined ingenuity of Mistress Blathers and Duff, and actually put on his hat preparatory to sallying forth to obtain the assistance of these worthies. And doubtless he would, in this first outbreak, have carried the intention into effect without a moment's consideration of the consequences, if he had not been restrained in part by corresponding violence on the side of Mr. Brownlow, who was himself of an irascible temperament, and party by such arguments and representations as seemed best calculated to dissuade him from his hot-brained purpose. "'Then what the devil is to be done?' said the impetuous doctor when they had rejoined the two ladies. "'Are we to pass a vote of thanks to all these vagabonds, male and female, "'and beg them to accept a hundred pounds or so apiece "'as a trifling mark of our esteem "'and some slight accomplishment of their kindness to Oliver?' "'Not exactly that,' rejoined Mr. Brownlow, laughing. "'But we must proceed gently and with great care.' "'Gentleness and care!' exclaimed the doctor. "'I'll send them one and all to never mind where,' interposed Mr. Brownlow. "'but reflect whether sending them anywhere is likely to attain the object we have in view.' "'What object?' asked the doctor. "'Simply the discovery of Oliver's parentage, and regaining for him the inheritance of which, if this story be true, he has been fraudulently deprived.' "'Ah,' said Mr. Losburn, cooling himself with his pocket-handkerchief, "'I had almost forgotten that.' "'You see,' pursued Mr. Brownlow, "'Placing this poor girl entirely out of the question, and supposing it were possible to bring these scoundrels to justice without compromising her safety, what good should we bring about?' "'Hanging a few of them, at least in all probability,' suggested the doctor, "'and transporting the rest.' "'Very good,' replied Mr. Brownlow, smiling. "'But no doubt they will bring that about for themselves in the fullness of time, and if we step in to forestall them, it seems to me that we shall be performing a very chaotic act in direct opposition to our interest, or at least to Oliver's, which is the same thing.' "'How?' inquired the doctor. "'Thus. It is quite clear that we shall have extreme difficulty in getting to the bottom of this mystery unless we can bring this man Monks upon his knees.' that can only be done by stratagem and by catching him when he is not surrounded by these people for suppose he were apprehended we have no proof against him he is not even so far as we know or as the facts appear to us concerned with the gang in any of their robberies if he were not discharged it is very unlikely that he could receive any further punishment than being committed to prison as a rogue and vagabond and of course ever afterwards his mouth would be so obstinately closed that he might as well for our purposes be deaf dumb blind and an idiot then said the doctor impetuously i put it to you again whether you think it reasonable that this promise to the girl should be considered binding a promise made with the best and kindest intentions but really do not discuss the point my dear young lady pray said mr brownlow interrupting rose as she was about to speak the promise shall be kept i don't think it will in the slightest degree interfere with our proceedings but before we can resolve upon any precise course of action it will be necessary to see the girl to ascertain from her whether she will point out this monks on the understanding that he is to be dealt with by us and not by the law or if she will not or cannot do that to procure from her such an account of his haunts and descriptions of his person as will enable us to identify him she cannot be seen until next sunday night this is tuesday i would suggest that in the meantime we remained perfectly quiet and keep these matters secret even from oliver himself although mr losburne received with many wry faces a proposal involving a delay of five whole days he was fain to admit that no better course occurred to him just then and as both rose and mrs maylie sided very strongly with mr brownlow that gentleman's proposition was carried unanimously "'I should like,' he said, "'to call in the aid of my friend Grimwig. "'He is a strange creature, but a shrewd one, "'and might prove of material assistance to us. "'I should say that he was bred a lawyer, "'and quitted the bar in disgust "'because he had only one brief and emotion of course in twenty years, "'though whether that is recommendation or not "'you must determine for yourselves. "'I have no objection to your calling in your friend, "'if I may call in mine,' said the doctor.' 
"'We must put it to the vote,' replied Mr. Brownlow. "'Who may he be?' "'That lady's son, and this lady's very old friend,' said the doctor, motioning towards Mrs. Maylie, and concluding with an expressive glance at her niece. Rose blushed deeply, but she did not make any audible objection to this motion. Possibly she felt in a hopeless minority, and Harry Maylie and Mr. Grimwig were accordingly added to the committee. "'We stay in town, of course,' said Mrs. Maylie. "'Well, there remains the slightest prospect of prosecuting this inquiry with a chance of success. I will spare neither trouble nor expense in behalf of the object in which we are all so deeply interested, and I am content to remain here if it be for twelve months, so long as you assure me that any hope remains.' "'Good,' rejoined Mr. Brownlow and as i see on the faces about me a disposition to inquire how it happened that i was not in the way to corroborate oliver's tale and had so suddenly left the kingdom let me stipulate that i shall be asked no questions until such time as i may deem it expedient to forestall them by telling my own story believe me i make this request with good reason for i must otherwise excite hopes destined never to be realized and only increase difficulties and disappointments already quite numerous enough come supper has been announced and young oliver who was all alone in the next room will have begun to think by this time that we have wearied of his company and entered into some dark conspiracy to thrust him forth upon the world with these words the old gentleman gave his hand to mrs maylie and escorted her into the supper-room mr losburn followed leading rose and the council was for the present effectually broken up end of chapter forty one